Welcome to the Further North Podcast, your weekly dose of the North Melbourne Footy Club. My name is Josh and this is a fan-run podcast doing match previews, reviews and everything North. Let's get it started. Further North Podcast. Uh, right off the bat, sorry about no preview podcast through the week. Uh, work and life took over for you guys who saw the Facebook and Instagram posts. Apologies. Uh, we'll be back next week, I hope. But here we are, ready for another review of a disappointing game, to say the least. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of conflicted. But if you want my raw thoughts, I'm disappointed with that performance. Looking at the fan response and looking at, you know, how some of my friends and just you guys commenting on on the posts are taking it, half the people are disappointed and half the people still see the positives. For me, I think that was a winnable game. And I know that we're missing Greenwood uh, and Simkin and LDU, plus others that we should have had ages ago. But the way we've played the last three weeks without those three together, I think we should have been going in and winning that game, especially down in Tassie. Um, I think overall I'm disappointed. Um, That was the worst we've played for the last four weeks. I don't think we did anything atrociously bad, but I don't think we really did anything great either. Um, But we're, we're not meant to be sort of on their level, I guess. But I think that's sugarcoating it. I think, I think that was a really disappointing game from us. The, the positives I can take is our floor seems higher now. Does that make sense? Like that was to me a bad performance and that was nowhere near as bad as what we dished up against the Lions, you know, against the Ds and, and, and those teams. So in one aspect, that's a positive. But from the standards we've set from the last three weeks, that was a pretty lackluster poor performance for me. I completely understand if some people disagree with that and I'm really positive that some people disagree with that for taking the positives and still saying, once we get this team together, we'll be okay. And I do agree with that, but the team's never going to be together. Look at all the injuries that happen every week in the AFL. It'll take time. I do believe we'll get there and I like the path we're on. But as an isolated game, I reckon we should have been winning that one. I reckon we should have won it on the form we've shown. But, hey, it is what it is. We went down 75 to 103 by 28 points to the Giants. And looking through some of the stats, we didn't really win anything. We didn't win clearances. We didn't win possessions. We didn't win efficiency. We were just below par the whole game. So I don't really think the Giants went out and won that. I think we sort of lost it. I don't like coming in with this negative attitude, you know. I try my best to keep it upbeat, but I think think that was a, yeah, like I said, a disappointing display for me. But look, let's get into the team lineup. And we really only saw one change. Um, We saw Paul Curtis come in, which I liked, um, and out goes Simkin and Greenwood with those concussions. Would I have done anything else? Cunnington is a good one to discuss. Um, I really think we could have used his leadership in the middle in that game, which we'll we'll talk about. But um, other than that, not really. I'm just looking at the team now. Spicer arguably earned his spot uh, in this team again from the week before. Uh, Aaron Hall, I guess, was a, a questionable one for some. Um, but other than that, I think the team was pretty good, especially with how good uh, the team was the week before. Now, some positives and negatives. There's not really much more to talk about the team lineup. Um, Cooper Harvey's and Jackson Archers, look, they don't look like they're coming into the team this year. Maybe later in the in the year, and I think we do have a question about one of those guys. But um, look, you, you can tell just from the, the vibe and, and <laughs> all the messages coming out of the club that they're not, uh, they're not playing anytime soon. So some positives and negatives from my end here. And there's not many positives, I'll, I'll be honest. 
watching the whole game, I'd write dot points down every quarter. And especially the second half, I just had nothing to write. They didn't do anything well, but they didn't do it so poorly that I had to rant about it. Do you know what I mean? At the start of the game, I thought we had much better forward 50 entry. And generally, like going into the forward line now, we're not just blazing it away as much as we were in the first, you know, six to eight weeks of the season. And you can see that Larky's getting more opportunity now. We're getting more marks inside the forward 50, but at least we're lowering our eyes because we are better in the midfield now. We are linking up and we're creating space for our midfielders to be able to look and lower our eyes and hit somebody. So I thought that was a positive. I thought we did well in one-on-one contests uh, in the first half. I think we did pretty well to win our battles and progress ourselves forward. Um, we did give up a lot of cheap goals on the counter-attack. We had the ball for so much of that first half. We were grinding it out, getting the ball forward, repeat entries, and then getting rewarded with a goal eventually. And then we'd just lose it and they'd just drift through our midfield and kick the easiest goal and all of our work would be undone. And that's been a bit of a trend from the last month. Um, but I thought one-on-one contest-wise, everyone around the contest did pretty well. Um, I think we're getting better at learning to stop runs of goals. Now, I know sort of the third quarter goes against that, but as a game and as a last month of football, I, I think we're much better at learning uh, to halt runs. The Giants, well, we sort of kicked the first couple, then the Giants kicked the next six or something, didn't they? Um, to be able to come back and get back in the game in the second and going into the third, I think that's good. Uh, that's not something we could have done in the first six to eight weeks of footy. So I think that's a really good positive to take. And I did mention it just before, but the effort is always there. And yes, it lacked in the second half, but it's so much more than the, some of the games at the start of the year where we just look like we did not want to be there at all. So I think our, our base level of effort has risen so much. Some players individually to talk about for the positives. Griffin Logue had one of his better games. He was intercepting everything. Um, if that's on the wing, half back, down in the back pocket, he was great. I love Griffin Logue. He's one of my guys and I think he's really showing his value for this team. Um, he had a better game than Mackay. Mackay was fine. Um, Jesse Hogan, I think, who apparently has played for every club in the league. I forgot he was still in the league. Um, he was very quiet all day. So Mackay did his job, but Logue was definitely a standout with his intercept marking. Uh, George Wardlaw, let's talk about the Warlord. You know how much I love the Warlord, guys. He was brilliant. If he doesn't get the NAB Rising Star, is it still NAB? Who cares? If he doesn't get the Rising Star nominee for this round, there's genuine corruption in the AFL. Kane Corns must be taking over from Gil McLaughlin if he doesn't get the Rising Star or Caro or some old dated has been like that. George Wardlow was brilliant. The way he attacks the football is second to none. He's set standards in this team and he's played four games and that's terrifying and fantastic at the same time. Um, he's so clean with the ball. He always hits a target. He's clean with his hands. He's ferocious. It's crazy. It's crazy. You mix Cunnington and like... Jai Simkin together and you sort of get George Wardlaw with Simkin's outside of the pack ability to dance around people, Cunnington's strength and in and under ability and just he's such a good user. So I, I love George Wardlaw and we're going to have questions about George coming up so I won't harp on too long but he was brilliant. Taron Thomas, um, his best game, his best game <laughs> out of two, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> I mean it's, it's factually correct but he, he's played two games. Um he was great. He was great. How important has he been since he's come back? I'm so happy that he's been able to come back and play well. All the boys get around him. What did he kick? Three goals? He kicked four goals in two games, guys. Like, that's crazy. How much did we miss his polish? I really, really hope for his sake and our club's sake that everything in his outside life goes well and he can stay here and be a, a vital player for the next 10 years at this club because... He's, he's class. He's genuine class. And he's attending a lot of centre bounces. And I like that Wardlaw and Thomas in the midfield sort of thing with Will Phillips. I think that's a great midfield. Um, Nick Larkey again, kicking another four goals. Could have had more. Yeah, he he is fantastic. And there's a lot of Nick Larkey chat going on at the moment. And we do have a question coming up later in the pod. So I'll save the Nick Larkey uh, 
you know, gushing for later. But um, what a brilliant player we've got on our hands. And it's interesting with Nick Larkey, you know, a lot of talk this year about kicking technique, especially with Harry Mackay, 45 out, goes for a snap and doesn't make the distance. And we're like, yeah, we knew you weren't going to make the distance and we don't play AFL football. Um, it's interesting to think about when people used to teach me to drop punt, you're talking to the leading goal kicker for the uh, under 16s country Tassie league here, guys. So I think I know what I'm talking about. I would have made it if my knee didn't blow out in that one game. But, you know, I think, remember when Drew Petrie would kick the ball and his leg, his foot would be, you know, basically above his head when he strikes the ball. And that's the the genuine and the classic kicking technique. That's how you, you drive your foot through the ball. You don't stab at the ball to kick goals. Nick Larkey takes that, throws it in the bin and goes, watch me be the best goal-kicking forward in the league. Um, he doesn't. He stabs at that ball every single time and it's pinpoint straight and he doesn't follow through like like Drew did. So very interesting to, to know now. There's You can have multiple kicking styles except for the snap, Harry, and, uh, and you get success. So great job by Nick Larkey. I'm pretty confident every time he gets a shot on goal, he's going to kick it. Uh, the last guy that sort of stood out to me Bailey Scott again, maybe not his best game in the last month, but he was around everything and he was always competing. He was running all day. I, I think we're seeing the best of Bailey Scott now. And, you know, his criticism at the start of the year was a little bit unwarranted for me. And um, I think he's shrugged a lot of that off now and he's really, uh, really pushing forward. One guy I did have in the list of best players was CCJ as well, but I don't know. I think he did things well, but didn't cap them off. Like he's always, he's a great target and it's, it's so important for us getting that ball away from our back line um, with him marking the ball on the wing. He took some brilliant marks up forward. Wasn't as accurate as he could have been, but I think he was pretty solid as well um, and consistently making an impact, even if he didn't get the results on the scoreboard. So CCJ was another good one for me. Um, I did take him off the list, but then I put him back on. I was 50-50. I think I was emotional after the game. But no, I think CCJ was pretty good. So to go into some negatives, because that's all the positives I really had. Not many positives to take from that. And there's not heaps of negatives either. I think this was a bit of a nothing performance from us as well. It was like, it was par. It's like vanilla ice cream. It's like, it's good. You never complain, but I don't know. It didn't blow my mind. Um, allowing marks coming out of the 50. When... When we would turn the ball over or, or kick a point, they were marking it on our forward flank so easily and we weren't locking that ball in. There were little periods of pressure where we'd lock it in, but nine times out of ten, they were getting a mark along that 50-metre line and transitioning it straight through our midfield, which tore us apart. It really did. Um, and they were walking it out of the 50 after that, like I just said. So we were so, so vulnerable in transition. They were just – it was like butter – like a knife through butter, um, them just transitioning the ball down the ground, out from the back 50, straight into someone's hands. And we would grind and grind and grind, get the ball forward, get a mark, get a free kick, make our own luck, and then we'd just give it up straight away. And that's the tale of our, of our sort of last month, I guess. Um, it'll come with time, it'll come with experience, but it was a bit disheartening to see. And an awful finish to a great quarter in the first. Uh, we did really well in the first quarter. We kept it tight. We, we, we kicked well uh, and we looked exciting. We looked on. We had all the momentum, you know, in the, uh, in the first half of that quarter. They kicked, what, three goals in about five minutes to end that quarter. Uh, and they kicked, it felt like they kicked a couple in the last minute, to be honest, which undid all of our good work. We, look, uh, we looked lost around both 50 metre lines is the next point here. And um, I've already sort of talked about our defensive 50 um, or, well, our forward line and them transitioning it out. At the other end, we couldn't get it out of our defensive 50. Um, and we've got a question about this later, but bombing the ball like McDonald and Zebul, just sort of sending that ball as far as they can. And everyone else sort of followed along, along with that in the second half. Um, you noticed in the second half, we started kicking the ball long again not having enough time on the ball and just sending it instead of handball, chain handball and linking up. Um, I think that's one thing that was pretty disappointing. Um, we would give up intercept marks on our forward and back 50 metre lines and 
We just couldn't get it into the middle of the ground once it got locked in. Zerha is conflicting. This is my next point. And I love Cam Zerha, but I, I, I'm starting to believe that when he's bad, he really hurts us. And when he's good, he's the best thing about us. Consistency is Zerha's number one thing to fix. Um, and that game, I think, proves that, where he, he had something like 10 or 12 touches for the game. And like last week, his first half was atrocious and his second half was brilliant. He kicked four and he nearly won us the game. But he did not make an impact at all in this game. So he needs to start learning how to impact a game if the ball is not coming into the 50 all the time or if it is going to the taller targets, you need to be at the bottom of packs. Um, you need to be pushing up into the midfield to get some possession and helping us drive the ball forward. So I'm not out on Zerha. I'm he, he always has his spot in this team, but that was a very poor Zerha performance. Um, I think the umpiring is pretty poor. I know, <laughs> I know this is a biased fan thing to say, but whatever, it's a North podcast. Jeez, the umpires were harsh on us in that third quarter. Just where we'd get the ball or where we'd give up the ball, sorry, was always so crucial. Um, you know, center bounces, free kicks in the 50, and it didn't seem to be going both ways. We got we got free kicks, but they'd be on the wing or something where we couldn't really make an impact. And that's on us as well. Um, but I thought the umpiring was, I don't know, it felt like a lot of the other games have this season where we'll give up free kicks in crucial areas and we'll gain them in nothing areas. There was an awful lack of pressure in the second half as well. Um, we couldn't. We felt like we couldn't lay a tackle. They were walking it out of the uh, the center square. They were walking it out of contests. I feel like we had guys grabbing onto tackle and they were just sliding off. It was like the opposition was covered in soap. Um, it's not like they had more players around the ball than us either. I think that's one thing we've done pretty well in the last few weeks, which I've been calling for for ages, but we just could not stick our tackles. Um, that's sort of what we were known for at the start of the year and the last three weeks we've had great pressure and that's what shin bonus spirit is, bringing heart and bringing effort, bringing pressure and make teams scared to know you're going to get hit if you get the ball. Um, but that was, yeah, the lack of pressure in the second half, shocking. First half was good, second half was bad. Tale of two halves. Um, and the midfield lacks experience. I think we saw that. I think as great as Phillips, Sheasel, Wardlaw, Thomas were last week, um, and some of those were in the best. I think Phillips was maybe a little bit quieter um, in that game, and so was Sheasel. Um, but we really needed a Jai, a Greenwood, a Cunnington in there, maybe just to be like, calm it down, boys. I've been here before. I'm going to show you how it's done. Jump on and let's do it. I think we needed some leadership in that midfield. Um, it's hard with injuries and all that sort of stuff. Nobody's fault there, but I don't know. That was pretty glaring for me. Um, a few of the players, Aaron Hall is one of them, um, who, in the negatives anyway. We're going to talk about Aaron Hall in some of the questions, so I won't go into that one just yet. Um, I mean, I will. I guess I will a little bit. Once again, Aaron Hall, the things he does well, he does very, very well. And the things he does poor, he does so poor. There was one that led to a goal where he was chasing. He just didn't put his body on the line in the middle of the ground. Uh, the Giants got the ball and ran away. He was chasing and didn't stick a tackle. Turning the ball over um, and getting caught, you know, in times where he's got maybe more time than he thinks he rushes or, you know, he thinks he's got more time and he doesn't and then he gets holding the ball. Um, yeah, up and down from Aaron Hall today. More poor than good though, definitely. Unlike last week where I think it was a bit of a split, this week he was definitely more on the poor side. Phoenix Spicer. Now this is an interesting one to talk about. Um, I, Phoenix Spicer did, did earn his spot um, from last week's game. That was probably the best game of his career, um, even though he did not kick any goals. And this is something I'll keep harping on. You can bring all the pressure you want in the world in the forward line. If you don't kick goals, um, you're not staying in the team. Spicer did kick a goal. Um, it was handed to him, I guess, <laughs> from someone running too far, but... Very poor from Spicer. Failed to really make an impact. He's not good in disposal of the ball. Um, and he, look, 
a, sp- a phoenix spice to tackle is him grabbing onto someone and hopefully they fall over. He's so small. So I don't think it was the best performance from Spicer and I'd definitely be chucking him back in the twos. Jaden Stevenson. steve had a brilliant year and I'm, I'm really happy for him that he's having a much better year, but he just failed to impact the game today. I liked his effort and his work rate. He was pushing down to the halfback line to try and get the ball and do something with it. And when he does get the ball, he's pretty clean with it. Um, I don't think he should be dropped or anything like that, but um, yeah, failed to make an impact today. Uh, Paul Curtis. Now, another player that's completely split by the fan base. I believe Paul Curtis needs to be kept in the team. Um, I know that he wasn't the best on the day. I think he had a pretty poor day and he really didn't impact anything. I can't really remember anything he did. But Spicer's got a run of games. And if Spicer gets three, four, five in a row, Curtis absolutely gets three, four, five in a row. And I know he's played consistently at the start of the year, but he's got too much talent and can do too much to be able to drop him, in my opinion. Curtis keeps his place, but I think he's he's on thin ice at the moment. He's also lucky that there's nobody else to bring in uh, as like a small forward. I guess we've got Robert Hansen Jr., but he's incredibly raw, guys, and I'll be surprised if he gets a game um, maybe in the last couple of rounds just to throw him a bone. But um, Cooper Harvey, I guess, is another one, but once again, it doesn't feel like he's close. I want to see Paul Curtis with a run of games and someone to put the fire in him Um, because we know what he can do. Um, Other than that, the only other point here for the negatives I've got is Dermot Brereton and commentary. Oh, my God. No wonder he's always been on Sunday games um, for for his entire commentary career. Dermy is just like the ultimate boomer commentator, isn't he? Just he, he thinks he knows everything everything about football. And to be fair to him, he's played the game, he's won premierships, he's much better football mind than I'll ever be. But God, it gets annoying listening to him explain everything like he he's just this football messiah. Um, so he, he always says he knows what the players are thinking. This is why they did that. And it's good to have that sort of insight commentary. But not every single time you speak, Dermot, please. Just give us some BT type stuff. Give us some one-liners and then come with a little bit of wisdom. Um, everything that man says is like a monk's, uh, a monk's teachings uh, to the youth and the, uh, the next disciples of the land. So, Demi, come on, mate. Pull your head in. All right. That's basically all the positives and negatives. Sean Atley, club champ. I'm giving Wardlaw the three votes this week. I'm giving Larky two. And there's two players that I'm completely split. Taron Thomas and Griffin Logue, who gets the one? Now, you guys might be angry at this, and I completely understand, but I'm breaking my own rules. I'm giving Logue and Thomas one vote. I genuinely can't split them. It doesn't feel fair to leave any of them off. Um, Both of them are getting one vote this week. It's my list. I can do what I want. Leave me alone. So they get one vote each. It's making things tight at the top. Um, She's was on 14 votes. She's hasn't got a vote for a little bit. Um... He did have a good game last week, and uh, but there's more players stepping up in the last month of football, and that makes it more difficult. So she's on 14, Larky on 12. LDU is still on seven votes. That's how good of a start of the year he had. Those three, who knows? I mean, steve has got five. Bailey Scott's on five. Wardlaw's now on five after four games. Griffin Logue's on five votes. It's getting tight at the Sean Atley Club champ, guys. So stay tuned. I'll keep posting the results. Um, And thank you for liking all of those posts. Um, Brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff on your end. All right, guys, question time. This week I asked you a question. Well, not a specific question, but I asked you guys to put your thoughts on the game into a question and we'll try and do some rapid fire. So thank you very much for everyone who wrote in. And just so you know, uh, at Further North Pod on Instagram and at, oh, not at, just Further North Podcast on Facebook. Thank you very much for everyone who follows that. Um, and thank you to everyone who wrote in. I can't read all of them once again. Uh, the, the community here is growing and I love every single one of you. Thank you for listening if it's your first time or you've listened to every single one. I'm getting too many comments now, guys, to be able to read them all out uh, without the podcast going for three hours. So um, I've picked, I picked them at random. Um, I've picked the best questions and some of the best statements here. And, uh, yeah, please write in every week because you never know when yours is going to get read out. So thank you again, guys. We're going to Instagram. We've got 
Aiden with a one, uh, Dot O'Connor says, who should replace Aaron Hall in his role? I think Eddie Ford or Powell, elite ball users. Um, that's an interesting one. I don't think Eddie Ford. I think Eddie Ford is better in the forward line or on the wing. Uh, I definitely wouldn't move him away from that. Um, I guess Taron Thomas is one to throw in there long term. I think if we get Simpkin, LDU and Greenwood back in this team, Cunnington I guess you could say as well, um, is Taron going to still play in the middle? I think yes, sometimes, but I could see him definitely off half back. So I'd probably say Taron Thomas personally. Um, but I like what he's doing in the midfield and pushing forward. He's clearly got an eye for goal. So who knows? Sheezel can push forward. Thomas can push forward. They can both play off half back. I guess it's one of those two. But maybe maybe Taron Thomas for me because our midfield is going to be pretty stacked when we do get healthy. Um, but thank you for that question, Aiden. Uh, we've got Black Licori- Licorice Poker. Black Licorice Poker. I, th- I think that's right. If that's right or wrong, please let me know. Um, why are they going, uh, who are they going to uh, replace Mackay for next year? We can't re-sign him. I'm back and forth on this one. Um, when we win, I think we'll re-sign him. And when we lose, I think we won't. We're really not going to know. You know, we did sign Zerha. We did sign Bailey Scott, um, off last year, which was atrocious. And we're playing so much better. Um, this year, uh, uh, I guess the question is not, are we going to sign him? It's who would we replace him? So as for, are we going to sign him? I'm legitimately 50-50. I've got no idea. I'm probably leaning towards we don't, um, but I've got my hopes up for him. Who do we replace him with? We've really got nobody. Um, Aiden Core is the obvious replacement. I'm not happy about that, but I think he'll come in if Ben Mackay goes and just keep playing it. We're paying him so much money. We may as well try and get something out of him, but it does not make me feel good at all. Um, other than that, we're going to get a few picks. If Mackay does go, we're going to get a compensation pick, which hopefully top 15, top 10, top 15. I don't exactly know how it works, but he's a pretty high-profile player. Um, we're going to get this probably the second pick, to be honest. Hawthorne are sort of starting to open the gap up on us a little bit. And, um, and we've got Port Adelaide's pick. Now, the interesting thing with this draft coming up is not that I know a heap of players exactly, but I do know there's a lot of key position talent um, in that draft. So I would say Aiden Core is going to be the obvious one and then hopefully we draft a key defender who can come in and start getting a body of work behind him to then be him and Griffin Loke if Mackay does go. That would be what I would want to do. Um, Long term, Core is not an option. So yeah, I'd say draft somebody, put Core in the team for his experience and then get that young guy to eventually overtake uh, Aiden Core. I don't see Miller Berg. I think Miller Bergman is not. He's not a key defender. He's not a guy to to mark a, a Joe Danaher, a, a Tom Hawkins, something like that. And we don't really have anyone else, do we? So definitely not Aiden Bonner. Um, we've got next question here from Amy underscore Lowry. Am I selfish for thinking we should have won that? And can we just sign George for ten years? Uh, no, you're absolutely not selfish. I also think we should have won that. The form we've put up in the last month deserves wins. This was the weakest team we've played. The first half shows that we could beat them. We just couldn't put four quarters together. I'm personally disappointed and think that was a bad performance an under par to bad performance. Um, because of what we've dished up in the last month as a, in a context of the season, I guess it might be viewed different, but no, you're not, uh, you're not selfish for thinking that I think that too, but I do know some other fans think it's still a good effort in the context of the season. So can be polarizing, but that's my thoughts. Uh, Mark loves beer. Great name. Um, Mark says, why have we given La- uh, Lukey McDonald such a long contract? Cringe. Um, I actually don't know what his contract is. I don't know how long it is personally. Um, I don't know. Luke McDonald's not the problem here though. I don't think Luke McDonald's never going to be our best player. He's never going to be our worst. Um, I think Luke McDonald's fine. I guess like a Jackson Archer or something one day maybe could take over his role, but he's still in his late 20s or something, isn't he? I, I think Luke McDonald's here for the long term. I don't really have a problem with that. He seems to be one of those players who gets a bit scapegoated, who we instantly, like Aaron Hall as well is a bit like that. As soon as the team's bad, we blame those guys. Um, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, but I don't personally have a massive problem with Luke McDonald. Toby Green is a very, very good player, so... 
you know, let's not blame Luke McDonald. Michael underscore Water. Are we going to win another game this season? I don't think so. This is interesting because I fully thought yes, but after that loss, because I am disappointed with it and I feel like we should have, I'm not as confident. I think we will because we it always had we didn't think we we're going to beat Richmond last year or anything like that. A win will come, but I don't know if I'm going to tip North for the rest of the year. Um, I've tipped them the last two weeks. I think they deserved the tip after the the times or the the games they had. But I don't know if we not if we're not winning against the Giants um, with the form we've put up in the last month. I don't know. It's not filling me with confidence and. I know it's me being a bit negative and I apologize for that, but it's just how I feel. I think we should have done a lot better um, in that game and it was poor. So I think we'll get a win. I think we'll at least one, um, two max. I don't think we're winning more than that for the rest of the year. Um, I think we're going to continuously put up decent performances and we're going to be better to watch and the future is going to show. Will that translate to wins? Maybe not more than one or two. I think we'll get one somewhere, but I – couldn't tell you when that is. It doesn't matter if it's Hawthorne. I don't know if we play West Coast again. Genuinely don't know. Uh, we've got Brad R. Richard. War, uh, Warlord, need I say more? LDU, Simkin, Greenwood back next week. Who makes way for them? Great question. Uh, great question. Let me have a look at the lineup again. So if those three come back in, who goes out? Phoenix Spicer goes out for me. Um, he's gone. I think uh, I don't want to drop Paul Curtis. Maybe Darcy Tucker. I don't think Darcy Tucker was great. Um, and Aaron Hall goes out for me. I think everyone else can can hold their spot. I don't want to see Aiden Core as the sub though. Um, hmm. Let's leave Darcy Tucker in. So the outs for me, Aiden Core, Aaron Hall, and Phoenix Spicer. In comes LDU, Greenwood, and Simkin. Maybe we put Paul Curtis on the sub. Put him as the sub um, because he needs to perform. And, you know, if you're not performing, you don't deserve as much game time. So Paul Curtis sub, and those three come in uh, for Aaron Hall, uh, Aiden Core, and Phoenix Spicer. Hopefully, hopefully you guys agree with that. If you don't agree let, with it, let me know. I'd love to hear. Uh, Harley Harbour, Warlord, massive. TT is a slayer. Larky, shut up and take my money. Let grow. Let's grow with youth. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, all those players were fantastic. I do think there's still great signs from that GWS game, even though I am quite down on it. Um, I think there's great signs going forward in the future. So once Clarkson's back and we have another preseason and going into next year, hopefully we just keep clicking because the game plan at least looks pretty set now and we're executing better. Um, A-M-H-A-R, Amar, Amar16 says, trade up for number one pick if West Coast get the spoon, question mark. Would I trade for the number one pick? This is interesting because I think it's a bit of a win-win for North Melbourne in this upcoming draft. It looks like we're going to get picked two. And in this draft, the most talked about number one draft pick I've ever heard of, Harley Reid. Obviously, he's the guy you get with number one. Um, the rest of the talent that I've heard about, there's a lot of key position talent. Now, key position talent is the number one thing North Melbourne need. Number one. If we get the number one pick, do you draft Harley Reid? Absolutely. But our midfield is very, very good already. So I think it's a win-win. If we get the number one pick, we get the best midfielder coming out of the draft in arguably a decade. Um, if we don't and we get, you know, have to stick with number two and Harley Reid goes to West Coast, we get to draft in areas that we need much more going forward. I probably wouldn't trade up for the number one pick um, only because – you know, LDU, Sheasel, Thomas, Wardlaw, Phillips, Simkin as a midfield going forward is pretty stacked. Um, I don't want any of those guys to be playing off half back or on the wing or half forward. Those guys should all be rotating through the middle. 
Um, we do have Tom Powell as well, even though I think maybe he's not quite going to make it. Um, so no, I would not personally trade up. Um, there is a chance as well that he doesn't want to go to West Coast or Harley Reid doesn't want to go to West Coast. And he tells them that. West Coast, uh, super, super aware of that sort of stuff. So no, I personally would not trade. I think if we fall into luck in getting Harley Reid at number number two, we obviously take that. Um, or we draft a position we need much, much more than a midfielder. Uh, Bryden Isles says, uh, about what you'd expect, uh, right in it for um, half the game, Zebul and Hall hurt us with no footy IQ in disposal. I do. Th- it's a bit hard on Zebul, I think. I think Zebul gets unfairly whacked a bit. I think his disposal has been decent enough for most of the year. And he has been one of our better players. Hall, I do agree with. Um, no footy IQ. I think Zebul's got a great footy IQ. Sometimes does lack in disposal though. But I think generally he's pretty good. Hall is always 50-50. He's like a little pocket rocket. Because we saw, you know, he's got the ball, handball, run forward, get it back and hit Larky in the 50, I think. And uh, that's Aaron Hawley's best. So conflicting, but um, yeah, I don't know. Let's see what happens with those two. I'd say Hall gets dropped and Zebul plays still. We need him. Uh, Reese.Delaney87 says, felt like Wardlaw and Shields were the only mids cracking in during the second half. Does Jay-Z need a rest? Um, for the, to the first point, I agree. Wardlaw and Shields definitely were the two getting around the ball the most, um, which is great for a young guy and one of the senior vets. Um Kind of sucks that Phillips didn't stand up like he maybe did the last few weeks. I don't remember Shears were getting heaps of time in the midfield. Um, and we were missing a lot of leadership. But, look, we move on. Um, Jay-Z need a rest? No, I don't think so. His intercept marking is fantastic and he's always putting his body on the line. And we just need leadership out there. So let's not forget, guys, Zebra's been in our top two, three at absolute worst best players this year. He's had a couple of poorer weeks, but... Look, let's not let's not overreact. He's been fantastic this season. Um, uh, Reese Brook also said the same sort of thing. Uh, does Zebul uh, get to play in the early game? And obviously, I don't think so just yet. Brody dot Spasanto says, "Who's going to be better, Wardlaw or Sheasel?" Now, Brody, this is a question that is so hard for me to answer, but I do know what I want to say. George Wardlaw arguably could be the best player in the comp one day. I haven't seen this level from a player in these, uh, you know, four games in ever, ever. I love Harry Sheasel. We love Harry Sheasel. The world loves Harry Sheasel and we're better because he's in the world. But Wardlaw's just got that thing. He's got that dog in him and he's got it. So Wardlaw has the higher potential for me. Both potential A graders, and I love how they contrast each other so much. This is they, These guys are going to lead us forward. But Wardlaw for me. It's close, but Wardlaw. Um, Jared Andrew says, will we continue to utilize the torpedoes out of the back line? Yeah, I think we will, Jared. I think we will. That'll come in time um, and when we get better quality players. Like I said, Zebra's important to this team right now. He's probably not part of our next finals run. Um when we get classier users like Sheezels and things that we can play off the back line, once Miller Bergman maybe comes into his own a bit more and is a bit more attacking, a bit more forward moving, um, we'll stop that. And we're going to play like the Pies do and all that sort of stuff. But for now, while Hall and, you know, Zebul, McDonald in the back line, you get what you get with them. And, um, yeah, I think we're going to keep doing that until – we get slightly high quality players coming off that back line. That could be a few years away with drafts and things like that and free agency. So I think we've got a bunker in. We don't want the Torp to die, do we? North Melbourne's keeping the Torp alive right now. They're playing that 70s footy. Uh, Riley underscore Masterson underscore 14 says, uh, time for Jackson Archer. I would give Jackson Archer a go. I, I absolutely would. Um, maybe not right now. I don't think anyone in the back line is so bad that you need to drop them. And I guess maybe Aaron Hall goes out, but you don't put a Jackson Archer to replace Aaron Hall. That's when you'd move a T- Taron Thomas back or put a Sheasel there. So I really want to see Jackson Archer um, playing 
before the end of the season. I think he can do a good job like what Luke McDonald's trying to do now on the smaller forwards. Um, maybe not time just yet, but going forward in the future, absolutely. Jackson Archer, back pocket, lock down Charlie Cameron and all those sort of blokes. Uh, Bailey Tyson underscore. Elvis going about his business quietly, getting overshadowed by the other young guns. Yeah, he probably wasn't – that wasn't his best game. I think he sort of floated in and out. But the times he does get around the ball, he does very, very well. So I think we're all on the Elvis train. He's holding his spot. And like I said a few weeks ago, he's come in, taken Curtis Taylor's spot and just ran with it. And that's what we want to see from players in the twos who come into the ones. So great job um, by Eddie Ford. I don't know. He's just classy and clean, isn't he? Which is great. Uh, SC. Mitch. Will we win a game for the rest of the season? Ah, oh, we did already touch on something like that. Um, we will somewhere, but at this point, I don't know where it's coming from. Um, but that is coming off a disappointing loss in my personal opinion. So I am a little bit down on North uh, compared to what I have been in the last three weeks before. Underscore Ben Hunter underscore. The senior players who should be leaders are letting us down. Um, except Goldie. Kids take over. Ah. Uh, Maybe in an isolated game, they're letting us down. But once again, Zebo's been brilliant all year, except for maybe the last couple of games. Um, Cunnington, I mean, if he was in the team, he'd be bringing leadership. And I think maybe in hindsight, maybe should have been picked. Um, Goldie does what Goldie does. Um, but yeah, I guess that's really all the experience. I think Liam Shields had a great game. That shows leadership. You know he's leading out there. So I'm not sure the old guys are letting us down. I think it was just a really bad performance from our team that's shown that we should be doing better. And that makes us think that there's no leaders or anything out there. So I don't know. I didn't, I don't think Zebul, Zebul's leadership has ever let us down personally. Skill errors sometimes, yes, but leadership wise, look, I still feel like he's the leader on that field a lot of the time. Simkin, I, I love as well, but he's not there. Um, yeah, let's not get too carried away and blame all the old blokes. All right, let's move over to Facebook. James Duke. Hall has to be dropped. Agree or disagree? Curtis did a couple of nice things, but doesn't fit in the forward line we have. Uh, yes, Aaron Hall does need to be dropped. I don't think it's like he absolutely 100% has to be dropped because the things he did well, I think he still does well. But with all those guys coming back next week, yes, I think he maybe is dropped. Um, Curtis, I've already talked about Curtis. Just give him a run and then we'll see. Um, I don't know. Because Michael Negri also says Curtis surely gets dropped. Um, not just yet for me. You can't bring one a guy in for one game and then drop him. Even Perez, Marnie got multiple, at least two, three games in a row. So he's just come back. He performs in the VFL. Give him some time because we know what he can do. Jason Elliott, Hall was lazy. Cora's the highest paid potato in the AFL. Spice's pressure is good, but he's like a 10-year-old hanging off a giant when he's tackling. Zaha needs to lower his eyes sometimes instead of trying to kick those big goals all the time, and Wardlaw's a jet. Agree with all of that, Jason, to be honest. Um, Hall, I don't think Hall was lazy, actually. I, I think he just, his disposal just quite isn't quite good enough, and that's probably why he's just been at the Suns and North. Um, but like I said, the things he does well, he does well. Core is the highest paper town in the AFL, 100%. Um, we know my feelings in and Core. Yeah, the Spicer hanging off people thing, I agree with. Spicer is just Kane Turner 2.0 to be honest, when you think about it. I know we want to love Phoenix Spicer and he's sometimes he's quick and agile and fun to watch, but he doesn't do anything that Kane Turner doesn't do. Um, Zerhar absolutely needs to lower his eyes. You can see Larky getting pretty upset with Zerhar a few times in that game. And yes, Wardlaw absolutely is a jet. Um, Daniel Pell. We really missed LDU and Simkin, but you can see that this young midfield just needs time together. There's just so much talent. Do you agree? agree 100% with that. We were missing the leadership and um, hopefully over the next week and after the bye, we can have these great performances alongside, you know, those more experienced players coming in. Uh, Toby Tanker, we have to look at re-signing that back line with more youth and speed, do we? Or don't we? Um, I, I think so. I mean, look, Logue's locked in. If we lock Mackay in, I think we're looking pretty good. Um we do need cleaner users off half back, but once again, I think maybe a Taron Thomas going back there uh, could give us that. Um, half back flankers are like midfielders these days in this AFL. So, yeah, I think we prioritise 
like as for drafting and free agency, I want key position players. I want more depth, and I want clean ball users. And those are the halfbacks and the wings and stuff like that. So, um, other than that, I think Mackay is the only one we really need to sign in that back line. I, I don't know of anyone else who isn't under contract next year. But if I'm wrong, let me know. Uh, Kevin Sheedy Jr. I did not read your name before I did this. We've extended Larky. We're sweet. Let's talk about Nick Larky. Uh, Channel 7 and multiple sources reporting that Nick Larky's turned his back on a uh, million dollars a year from other clubs to re-sign with North, um, saying, you know, we were the only ones willing to take him at pick 72, I think it was, um, and he's going to repay the faith. And I love, absolutely love Nick Larky for this. Nothing screams shin bone of spirit like what Nick Larky's putting out right now. And, you know, turning down a million bucks to stay at this team, it's it, it clearly shows we're doing something. Simkin resigns, Wardlaw Shees will resign, Larky's about to resign. Ben Mackay, look around you, mate, because there's something happening here. It might not seem great now, but as a North fan and as as a North community, we know what's happening here. So Nick Larky plaudits go to you man like honestly we all love you so much you're you're a key going forward and he's captain material as well um he leads he's vocal he's in the leadership group but in the future i'd love to see simkin and larky being captain and vice captain so yeah i think wardlaw will get there too one day but look it is what it is but yeah fantastic news about nick larky hasn't been confirmed let's wait to see it on the club website but very strong reports so that does make me very very happy because yeah a million bucks a year at other clubs. Swans and that was another team. I can't remember. Essendon apparently wants all of our players. But screw Essendon. Who cares about them? Uh, Richie White. We just need to put four quarters together. We are improving, but GWS caught us out. We lapsed for about 15 minutes in the third quarter and it killed us. TT looking awesome. We could play Carlton right now. We would kill him. Yes. Um, we cannot put four quarters together. I think we did against the Bombers basically. We just look a bit tired. I think maybe the buyer's coming at the right time. Good luck against the Bulldogs next week, though. I think the Bulldogs would do us pretty convincingly. But, um, yeah, it's patches in games now. The Pies was the same. I guess the Bombers was the same. And, yeah, patches. But that comes with experience. That comes with experience. Would we like to play Carlton now? Absolutely. We'd do Carlton by about 50. Anthony Cullen. What's more important to address? Improve in the short term. Disposal efficiency? across the whole team, um, or forward 50 pressure. I think it's disposal efficiency. I think we've been better at forward 50 pressure um, in the last few weeks. Uh, But look, both to be honest, but if you're making me pick one, disposal efficiency. Um, I think transitioning the ball from the back line and getting it forward is much, uh, you know, is much bigger thing to improve moving forward. The forward 50 pressure will come uh, when we get Curtis Taylor, Curtis Taylor, Paul Curtis doing what he did last year because it will come once we get like a sheasel in there. Uh, if Taron Thomas does go up there, um, getting Spices and, and Kane Turner's nowhere near this team is not going to do that. So um, for me, disposal efficiency, but obviously forward 50 pressure is crucial as well. Um, let's see what we've got next. Is that the last question? I think that's the last question. So thank you very much, guys. Um, thank you for all your questions, honestly. Uh, I liked doing that. I liked you guys asking me a question um, that encapsulate your thoughts and then we can sort of discuss it together. So I might do that a little bit more moving forward. I love reading out your just general comments and your frustrations and I'll continue to do that as well. But I don't know. I think the questions make for more of a, a better discussion for you guys to listen to as well. So let me know what you thought about doing more questions instead of just statements. Um, We're going to go into some reviews now. Um, So once again, if you guys do listen on Apple, give me a five-star review and leave your thoughts and I'll read it out. And also on Spotify, you can comment on the Q&A for the episode and give me five stars and I'm also going to read your thoughts. So we did get an Apple review. Um, I haven't been able to find the guy left me a two-star review a few weeks ago. Sounds like uh, probably a salty Western Australian from our dominance of that entire state. But, hey, it is what it is. Uh, Gilly Sprints. Gilly Sprints gave me a five-star review. Say, rootastic content. Thank you, my friend. 
best North fan, uh, North Melbourne fan content you can find. I really appreciate that, mate. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, you're part of the North, uh, the North fan club here at Further North Podcast. Over to some Spotify comments here. Uh, we've got Inflatable Cactus says, need more Eddie Mazda body oil. I think he could start selling that. So like a Belle Delphine bathwater thing. I think if we, uh, we get Eddie Ford at the end of the game just to scrape his skin of all of the body oil he put on, little jars, and then you can uh, sell that off. I'd be pretty happy to do that. So Eddie, if you're listening, um, I'm happy to distribute that for you and advertise, get in the marketing sphere for you. So please contact me. Uh, but thank you, Inflatable Cactus, uh, for that comment. Um, and the last one, Paul Minotti, uh, regular around here. Another great pod, Josh. Love listening to you and Marnie talk the Kangas in an upbeat time. Thanks once again for reading out my Facebook message. No worries at all, Paul. Um, I'll always try and get to yours when you do comments. And um, yeah, been a, been a listener from very early on in this podcast. So thank you once again, my friend. So uh, because we didn't get to do the preview podcast last week, I didn't get to read out the um, the obscure player of the week. And maybe not super obscure, but let's call it the nostalgic player of the week. Nathan Grimer. How good was Nani? And this was the most commented, uh, the most commented one I've ever done. Um, so just some comments from your Nathan Grimer memories here. Um, Paolo Nichols, Nicholas, Paolo Nicholas, Nani with a heart. Couldn't agree more. I love him too. Stephen Dempster has to be his goal with the broken foot resting forward. All the interview he did uh, on before the game, talking about his old man and pranking him. Gold. It's classic Nani stuff. Peter Wright, hilarious club character, brilliant uh, relationship builder with players and staff alike. Average football player. Yeah, maybe not average. I think he held his spot for a few years there. So I think he was, he was above average. Uh, with tons of heart and truckloads of love for the club. Get around me, boys. Thank you, Peter. Robert Matarano. Martarano, Matarano, come on, mate. Let me know if I butchered that. Give him an exasperated hug to Tom Hawkins. Uh, giving him an exasperated hug to Tom Hawkins at the end of the 2014 semi-final when Geelong were coming hard. Man was a trooper. Yeah, how good was he? I love that. Jason Elliott, the goal celebration against Essendon. That's probably the most iconic, isn't it? Um, James Duke. He was such a character. One of my favorite players had so much potential, just injuries ruined him. He's always a life norther for me. Natasha Burns, our, uh, our official North Melbourne historian, Natasha Burns, his goal against that team I won't mention, that goal was the best. Such a happy joker. Jeff Robinson, don't underestimate this guy, was given some very big jobs on very good power forwards. Undersized and underweight, most of the time he beat these guys and especially in big games. Did he beat them most of the time? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe some rose tinted goggles there for Nani, but um, he was good. He was very good. Um, we were a better team with him down back. Injuries were really cruel to him and took their toll in the end. Robbed him of many more games, and I believe a better reputation career-wise. Yeah, that's probably true. Chris Hamilton. Nani was clearly robbed of the AFL goal of the century. The goal against the Dons was great. The celebration was better. Um, but his story about how he kicked it was best. A very funny guy and great football player. P.S. would always make room to plug his turf business. Does he have a turf business? I'll find that out and I'll plug it. Maybe he's uh, joined Fraser Gehrig at Tough Turf. Richie White, his first goal back in round 21, 2013, uh, versus the team we love to beat in finals. When he put, um, <laughs> when they put him up forward with a left foot snap around the body, followed uh, by... Get around me, boys. <laughs> yes. They swarmed by all the shin boners and, geez, his smile would have been seen back at Arden Street. It was that rassive. Okay, I like what you've done there. Then his post-match interview with Kingy was a classic, which is his first interview ever. Nicholas Ed Pasco. After the siren in the final against Geelong, he was standing behind Tom Hawkins as the siren blew. He immediately started hugging him. <laughs> That's a great one. Joshua Racco, anytime he was in front of a camera. How much of a character was this guy as well? Yeah. Th that's one of those guys that is just, how do you describe it? Like pure, pure locker room sort of stuff. I'd love it if he was around the club now. I feel like he's got a, a business now doing Is he part of those boys that like 
fit houses and do that sort of stuff. Anyway, a couple of Instagram ones quickly to finish off. Bailey Tyson underscore hugging Tom Hawkins <laughs> again at the semi final. Jack Crow six hugging Tom Hawkins again. Jeez, this is a good memory for you guys. Uh, Daniel Am- Ami, he took an out of bounds kick in right beside the point post and then he hit the post kicking it in. Classic Nani. Uh, Jacob McAuliffe underscore had to be the only person which his number on my back. Oh, he had his number. Jacob, you're a real fan. Send me a photo if you've still got the 17 North uh, Guernsey. I'd love to see it. I'll post it up. And SC uh, underscore Mitch can't beat that goal we kicked in 2013. Obviously, Jesus, that's some popular ones. Uh, oh damn, another another name, Paul Petrocelli. I think I nailed that, Paul. Um, his goal against the Don still brings a tear to my eye. Absolutely, um, a few key Nani moments. So thank you guys for for writing all those in. It's fun to reminisce, isn't it? Just about some of these guys. And um, he was a true a true. I don't know, I'm not, not warrior and not shin boner, but just like he just, what the, how do I describe Nani? Happy face around the club. He's a guy you want in the locker room and you come to work every day because of guys like that, don't you? So hopefully I did him justice there. Um, we're going to do a quick round review quickly. I'm recording this on the Monday afternoon. Um, so Thursday night, the Saints beat the Swans by 14 points. A um, bit of a nothing game. It was a bit grubby game, but good job. The Saints, uh, Mason Wood, probably the reason that they're winning. Um, Bulldogs, Port. Port win again. I hate Port Adelaide. Bulldogs, pull your heads in, even though they're probably going to do us by 50-plus next week. Um, wish you could have beat Port, though. Hawthorne. This is an interesting one. Hawthorne clearly aren't tanking, and I think Hawthorne are a better team than us. It has to be said. I thought we'd be well above them this year, Um but no, they're a much better unit. I think we've got better top quality talent, but um, the Hawks are a better team than us right now, and, and that's showing. Um, the Crows destroying the Eagles. Oscar Allen only kicked one goal. Nick Larkey got four. So uh, everyone, please keep an eye out on this bet. Um, I've been telling Began at work how much you guys have uh, been been messaging me about the bet and how much you guys are into this bet we've both got, and that made him very angry that I've got a whole community of North fans onto this bet. So... Please keep writing in about it um, and I'll show him at work and you can see him get angry. Fremantle and Richmond. Uh, Richmond got it done. Doesn't surprise me. It is funny um, being a barber, like I say, every single week. Um, all the Tigers fans that come in are so off the bandwagon for the Tigers, which is crazy because I ask them about the games they've been playing and they go, no, nah, I didn't watch it. And I'm like, your team won three premierships in like the last seven years or whenever it was. Like they deserve your respect, guys. Come on. But – the Tigers fans have jumped so quickly off the Tigers bandwagon at a sniff of some average form. But, hey, I'm sure they're all there for this one too. Um, Carlton doing Carlton things. It was an all right game to about half time, I think, and then it was just an absolute shellacking. Um, but the Blues, maybe they should tank for Harley Reid. Um, and currently the Demons are currently beating the Pies, 57 to 47, which is very, very interesting. Um we're in the fourth quarter, about 10 minutes left in the fourth, so I should probably finish this podcast and go and watch the rest of it. Um, but, yes, uh, that should be a tight game. I'd love the Ds to win it. I, I really, really would. So thank you very much, guys. Um, thank you very much for listening. A few of you guys did tell me to plug my barbershop. Um, and if you've listened all the way to the end of this podcast, you're a real fan and I know you're going to turn up. So if you guys live in the eastern suburbs – and don't currently have a barbershop, want to come in and just talk North Melbourne for half an hour, my barbershop is called Black and Brown. It's in Mitcham, right across from Mitcham Station. So Black and Brown is abbreviated B-L-C-K and B-R-W-N in Mitcham across the road from the train station. You can jump on the website. You can book a time with me. You can request Josh on the website. And when you make your booking, you can leave a comment. So leave a comment and say, uh, I'm coming from the podcast and I can convince my boss to sponsor me, you know, which would be great. And we can grab some more business for the shop and we can talk north every four to six weeks when you come in for a haircut. So if you do want to come down and get a haircut from me um, and talk North Melbourne around the Mitcham area, um, Black and Brown Barbershop across the road from Mitcham Station. I actually see, I'm, I'm excited to see how many of you guys actually come down. That'd be great. 
Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for listening again, guys. Preview podcast should be back next week as long as my life permits. It's been a bit hectic lately, so I do apologize. And um, yeah, thank you for engaging. Thank you for all your comments. Thank you for listening. Sorry I was a little bit negative at the start of the podcast, but it's just how I feel. We go into the doggies next week. Um, There might be some information on some Bay 29 um, stuff with the North Melbourne closer to a flag guys. So if I do get any information that there's going to be tickets for Bay 29 against the Bulldogs, um, I'll let you guys know. I'll post about it. I'll talk about it on the preview podcast. And let's go down there and make some noise and beat the doggies next week. Thank you very much, guys. I'll talk to you soon. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Further North Podcast. We'll be back next week with more great North chat. See you then, Bruce fans.